So the our city club slash sign in. So as you guys know, it helps us get you guys more sponsors, cooler swag, and helps us connect you with companies and get you guys jobs. So stickers, lots of stickers. They're all up here. I got a whole bunch. Don't come up here right now. Some up here at the end of the presentation for today. Um, we get some stickers. You'll also be at the uh, at live too. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna start off with some news, uh, and we're gonna have one of our members, Joel, actually do news today. Hey guys. So um, this week there was a couple of things. Uh, one, Facebook um, released OS Query. So if you don't know what OS Query is, OS Query is like you know MySQL or SQL queries. Basically, OS Query turns your computer into a database. So you can query for processes, you can query for loaded kernel modules, all that really cool stuff. It allows for really good threat analysis, so you can kind of compare like your loaded kernel modules previously to the new things that are being loaded in. Uh, you can see when that process has been started, uh, and all with the ease of kind of the SQL uh, query format. So yeah, that's pretty sweet, and it's, uh, it's open source. So next, um, how many of you know what Kremlin on Security is? So uh, Kremlin Security is a really popular uh, security law. Uh, and so it was hit by a big, big DDoS attack uh, last week, it? And so uh, it, it actually took, took the site down, and uh, Akamai was hosting his blog. Uh, they stopped posting it because they couldn't handle the uh, amount of traffic that was coming in. Um, so then the DDoS kind of pivoted to a couple other really big things like OVH. OVH is a big server host there, kind of based in Canada, France, and all over the place. Um, and so this was like one of the biggest DDoS attacks that's kind of been like publicly seen or mitigated by anybody. Um, so it, it, it's uh, interesting because the way that they were doing it was uh, it's like a bunch of unsecured internet of things devices. So um, like IP cameras. Um, just kind of random devices. So within two days, um, like the first two days of the DDoS attack, uh, 6,800 new cameras were added, and each camera can put out between one and 30 megabits per second of DDoS power. So that's kind of powerful. Um, so then uh, in the next two days, another 15,000 cameras were added. Um, so DDoS attacks reached, I think, uh, 1.5 terabit terabits per second, which is ridiculous. Um, so um, just kind of if you have like an IP camera or something connected to the Internet of Things, making sure that it's uh, secure and it's not open to like vulnerable attacks, like reverse shells and stuff, is going to be really important. Um, and you're kind of with last week's being uh, the Linux offense and now, or Linux defense and this week Linux offense, you're going to kind of understand better um, the power of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So a TLDR for those who don't know, like IoT cameras basically run. Linux. It's a very minimal Linux, but it's, it's, it's there. It's Linux. So you can run, like, it's kind of like what you guys run in the lab and stuff like that. I mean, it's there. So you can run binaries and stuff like that. I mean, it's a little Linux distribution running on that device. It's basically a computer. So keep that in mind. Uh, okay, so next, um, who knows what System D is? All right, so System D, uh, if you've ever set up something like a service, FTP, SSH, um, Apache, uh, any kind of service on Linux, it's all managed by what's known as System D. Um, and so, basically, this this, this uh, exploit or vulnerability was, was found, and it's been in the code for two years. And any user can run this command, um, regardless of their elevation, and it'll hang System D. Um, and it won't respond to anything. Uh, it can't start or stop services. Um, and so that's kind of powerful. Basically, um, this MG string here. There's a, there's a check inside of system D, and it sees if it's a zero-line string, but it doesn't do anything if it is, and so it just hangs, and it doesn't know what to do, so um, that's really bad, and there's actually a whole lot of issues inside of system D that are really um, being paid attention to, so um, just keep that in mind, uh, like, make sure that you kind of lock the guy, I don't know if there's any uh, 
a phone number on your phone and it checks whether that's a normal number or a message, um, it makes a query after search. And so Apple keeps track of that. It keeps track of your IP and the time and what the number was. And so they are willing to give that information out uh, to Sabina or Google for which is kind of worrying because that basically means that they can see where you were at what time and who you were contacting. Um, even though iMessage is said to be end -to -end encrypted, um, for instance, if you store your iMessages in iCloud, um, if you restore them in iCloud backup, that means that somehow they have to be encrypted, which means that they're being encrypted with a key that's known by Apple. So um, if you don't want that to happen, you're going to have to do a local iTunes backup instead, um, which still leaves you somewhat vulnerable because they have to be encrypted somehow um, if you're restoring the message history. Um, and then, uh, basically, there was this uh, this blog or, or company known as The Intercept, and they, they were the ones who got all this information about uh, just like what kind of information that Apple's going to give out. Um, so even though Apple's like super poor in your privacy, they get like a spin corner about like uh, iMessages, if you're doing something sketchy, wouldn't recommend doing it over iMessage, but I mean, to each their own. Um, so, um, yeah, so just you know, be mindful of what you do over iMessage because they, they will give out um, information about it. Cool. All right, thank you.
So, all right, this week we have a professional flash mob from Brandon in the back. You ready, Brandon? I'm ready when you are. All right, come on up. So this is Brandon Bauer. He works at Alphamai. Uh, he was a previous RC3 e-board president, and he's actually the founder of RC3. So give this guy a round of applause. <laughs> You'll notice I'm not actually in our information security department, but we do have one, and it's very awesome. 
describe what I do is that I look for things that have fallen through the cracks. Uh, so for example, uh, we have a highly customized version of the Grub 2 loader. Um, if you know anything about boot loaders, you know that they all suck, <laughs> including the Windows one. Um, and we have to deal with that as well on occasion, and I'm not happy about it. And so uh, the Grub boot loader basically uh, is sort of like a shell script parser. Your configuration is actually a script that it executes line by line. If that doesn't work right, your machine won't boot. Um, most of the machines that we have in our infrastructure are some in some random data center in some phone club corner of the world, and nobody is here physically. So anytime that that breaks, somebody of ours or a, con or a contractor has to go out to that location and unplug the system. That is expensive, time consuming, and something we don't want to do. So I pay a lot of attention to the bootloader. They have the APIs around me. I break it all the time. The developers didn't break it behind me, and he takes my share. Google search for specific 
file connect to things that can relate to current information, um, do your routine MDAP scans, and <coughs> social engineering is probably the easiest way. The easiest way to get someone to count is to simply ask for it. You can write a convincing enough email, you can say, hey, Bob over at HR, your bank account got hacked, you need to put your credentials in, and Bob probably tells him he uses the same password everywhere. So, and then he goes, what's up, what's up? Are you that exact name? What? We did that exact page you know, to do a demo. I don't know. We don't have no mail set up for this demo, but later this year you'll, you'll be able to do social engineering and send mail later. We'll send send. Okay, don't worry, we'll do social engineering. Okay. So after you do that, you know where they are, you have some sort of access. <coughs> Maybe if you don't, you try and force your way in if you can't simply ask for the password. Um, find an exploit that's on a remote listening service. Um, try some really crappy passwords to see if you use password, crappy passwords and brute force it. And then once you're finally in, you have to make sure that you're going to stay in, right? You have to persist. You got to make sure that whatever malware or scripts or things that you have calling back, keep calling back so that if you get booted out, you're not booted out forever. So the whole thing kind of revolves around this whole point, right? So you have your initial recon. Um, you compromise. You get a foothold. That's your first access to the system. Okay, from here, you persist on the system, make sure that you can't get booted off, and if you do, you can get back in. You attempt to escalate privileges to see whatever you can do. If you just get in and bob from HR, see if you can bypass some of the user access controls in the system to obtain like a higher level of privilege, and then you see what you have, right? There's this whole thing called lateral movement. I have one system that I have access on. We'll take Bob from HR again. Well, Bob can access his machine. What other machines can Bob log into? Bob log into all of the presentation room machines because he's in HR. Does he have access to see other people's files and other people's information? He's in HR, so they have a lot of personal details. You can find personal details about somebody who said, hmm, this might be a password choice, as well as like a target of password attack on another account that you may know that is privileged. So the whole idea is that you get your access, you get as high as you can, you try and spread yourself as wide as you can to see, okay, where are some other like vectors that I could go after, then you try and get another account or another type of access. And just leather, rinse, and repeat. Do the same thing over and over and over again until you have the tools that you need to get the job done. Whether it's stealing information, whether it's owning the domain from the top of the domain controller all the way down, uh, whether it's shutting machines off from the inside, whatever you want to do, you have to gather the right tools to go along with the community. So you really, really, really need to understand your target. Right? If you're going after a financial institution, what types of systems do they have? Somebody, someone who processes a lot of financial data, what kind of systems do they have? COBOL. Windows. COBOL, right. COBOL runs on what, Brad? <laughs> I don't know. Mainframes. Big old mainframes, okay? Mainframes are big, mainframes are old, and main, the financial industry loves mainframes, okay? Understand your target, understand the attack surface that they have, and then cater your attacks towards what they're actually doing. If you're launching attacks that are for some completely different type of system, or if you're going at it as if they were um, a temporary work agency as opposed to a financial processing agency, they're going to be completely different. Often what people will do is they'll put a big wall around the monitor, and then that's really all they have. They're, cut, they're checking out the check boxes and their audits, they're putting their firewalls in on the outside, but as soon as you can find a single entry point, it's pretty much trusted on the inside. That's kind of a really big problem with security landscape as a whole, but that's another topic that we can talk about later. And getting in often really isn't elegant. You're not sitting down there for 10 hours and going beep boop boop bop and messing up, like messing up all the bits and stuff. Often someone forgot to delete a VM, someone left the default credits on there, someone just allowed root login or the password. It's really simple stuff a lot of the time. So port scanning, we've gone over that, find the services. Um, traffic collection, so you have some sort of access on the network. Listen to what's going on. If you can't do any sort of active scanning because you know that any sort of scans that you do are going to get caught, you're going to get flagged, your machine's going to get shut down, and you're going to lose your only point of access, go to make into monitor mode. Listen to what's going on. If you get a big PCAP that you can pull out, you can enumerate everything that's going on in the network from that network segment. You can see what services they have, where they call out to, um, the main Active Directory service that they're calling out to, 
covered the NS authorities and put them in the network. Um, vulnerability scanners, if you have the ability to send a decent amount of traffic, you can use things such like Nessus, um, uh, OpenBoss. I'm going to say GreenBoss is a security system that does like the back end of OpenBoss. Um, OpenBoss, there's a whole bunch of programs that go out and do large scanning on a large scale and cross referencing that information with uh, publicly known vulnerabilities. So if you have the ability to do that, do it. But it sends a lot of traffic. And if there's like anything with the SCADA network, SCADA is like about as like structurally sound as this sticker right here. <laughs> So a little bit of poking and it's going to explode. Um, also, printers. If you scan printers sometimes, they just explode because printers are just, I don't know who makes them, but they don't make them well. So what sort of scanner do you scan? <laughs> you scan a scanner. I don't know. Probably it's <laughs> So we've gone through ways to get in. Right? Force your way in. You use an exploit of sorts. And you do social engineering and all these things that we have done, right? So you're on the system, right? You've gotten over the initial poke through the network, you have your foothold. What do you do? You're looking at this from just one system perspective. Gather the operating system info, right? So let's, let's talk about Linux, because that's the whole like, the focal point of this week. You name dash A. That'll grant you, um, it'll display to you like the name of the operating system. You name command can do a lot of a lot of information about the kernel that's running the operating system um, and what kind of base things it supports. Um, the cat proc version will give you more information. And, uh, D message is the daemon message command. You can view messages that are printed out by like, the system itself. And then you can grab for Linux to see like, what your strong Linux is doing. Um, there's a lot of different environment variables that you can go through, look at different services that are running. Right, so you've got on maybe through SSH and you couldn't see anything else because they have firewall set up properly, right? When you get on the system, you look at all the services that are running and you say, okay, there's a web server and a file server here, but we couldn't find that out before because it was firewall. So now you know what that system does and what its capabilities are, and you can say, okay, well, groups of employees are connecting to this machine for this purpose now. Look at the connections, right? So you know the function of it, you know what, what people are actually connecting and doing if you have a service that's kind of just like sitting up there like someone forgot to shut off the FTP server like seven months ago, it might be like a good idea to host something there and like use that as a download point for the rest of the network. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and look and see if it's connected to any other any of the other machines on the network. Uh, how does it interact with like non so persistence. We've gone over getting in, we've gone over looking around the system, we gotta make sure that we can actually stay on the system. There's no one way to persist. You're not just gonna hit the persist button and have magic persistence forever, right? We're gonna go back to this whole thing that Rubik said one time, two is one and one is another, and I really can't stress that enough. If you've got one like one way means of access, and you use that one means of access, you get really loud and someone goes, no, brings down the band hammer on you. You're done. That's it. You put all your time in making sure that one shell does something really good, you're done. You're not getting back in. After that, they firewall every cleanup, and you can't get back in. And that system's basically dead. So, critical system services, you have to look for those, right? What has to stay up on this system, and what does not need to? So go back to the story there, like you know um, about uh, information security army division where they were getting hacked by some unknown entity and they're like, oh no, we're getting hacked and they just unplugged the cable. Just unplugged it. And the German was like, what the hell are you doing? And he's like, we are getting attacked. We couldn't stop it. We pulled off the cable. He's like, yeah, well now all my guys out in the field are getting shot at and they had no information and now they're all dying because you decided to pull the cable. Sometimes pulling the cable not your option. And sometimes that's what the Red Team is about to find this critical infrastructure that you can't pull the cable on. So take that to heart that sometimes you can't pull it out. So, so yeah, oftentimes you've gone through like forensic analysis or like an incident response part. You don't really just want to kill the process because you're not finding the problem, you're just playing whack a whole process. But we'll talk about that later. That's the least. 
So understanding how to persist really understands the systems administration, right? You have to know how the system works, you have to know how to work with the system, and you have to know how to take advantage of it, right? So cron, we talked about cron last week, I believe, right? Cron allows you to schedule tasks, right? So if you want to make sure that your process runs, you set it in cron, right? Or you can start it as a service that gets started by SSFD and put it in one of the run levels that bring it to the um, Something to ensure that it starts whenever your system starts. So basic English, create that for us. Create ways for you to get in. Um, one thing you can do is you can change the system users or users for programs. So like your web server will have, the Apache web server has a user www data. What you can do is if you have enough privileges, you can change their login shell to be instead of slash bin slash no login to slash bin slash bash. And then you can have a bash shell for that. And then when they see sessions running at www data, they're going to think, hmm, that's really not that weird because you get a web server running and that um, user needs to execute commands. So you can also do something called backdoor and binder, right? You can take a command and you can make it do something malicious, right? So for example, password binary, you can change it so that instead of actually changing the password, what it does is maybe sends the password that they're trying to change off to a server that you own and then actually change their password or just not change their password at all. So you can mess with the binary to be able to do things that you want to do that can get you some sort of information. Uh, I already went over things that were boot. Uh, I already went over configure your game and system scripts. You can schedule tasks. And then <coughs> you can put um, shells in totally wrong places. Most people are to that. So, I'm going to go over like, the difference between a bind shell and a reverse shell. Okay, so we have a system over there, right? System over there, and I want to connect to it, right? I know that I set up the back door. I say, system, I'm going to connect to you. And it goes, okay, and here's a new shell. That's a bind shell. I'm connecting out to it, right? What if right there is a firewall? What do I do? I go, hey, what's up? And then I walk like flat into the wall because of the mine. I'm apparently doing that. Okay. <laughs> so I can't do that, right? So if you try to use a bind shell, there can be something in your way depending on how the network is set up, right? If they have a pretty good perimeter defense and you just try and run at it and say, you're going to listen over there and then I'm going to try and connect to you, your path might be closed off, right? But the problem is that most people trust the inside. Right? Most people trust their employees, which is kind of bad. Um, what if instead I listen, I'm the attacker, and then that system over there is configured to call out to me, and then when it calls to me, it's going to present me with a shell, right? So since that firewall there trusts the users on the inside, that machine can call out to me if I take advantage of um, their firewall rules, because who's going to block web access for their employees? I can have someone call out to me and then establish the connection that way. So, in terms of web applications, right, if your only access is a web application that's being served by a web server, um, and you don't have any access to get to anything else, there are still problems that you can find with the web server itself, right? So we're going to go into web and all the different attacks we can do in a couple of weeks, or in a month-ish, and about a month-ish, so we'll dive into that a little bit more. But one idea is that of a web shell, right? So your web server, it runs a language, right? It has a programming language that runs the server, okay? You can't just throw things on a machine and then all of a sudden it magically gets served up. There's some program that does that. And one of those languages is often PHP. So what you could do is you could find a way to upload a file to the web server, right? Maybe it's written poorly, it's not close to, or maybe it has a file upload capability and then it just doesn't check, right? And say you're saying, oh I'm uploading an image, but you're not really uploading an image, you're uploading a PHP file that contains the ability to make commands or make calls to the system. Right? So when you go and you visit that JPEG image that you've so cleverly disguised your uh, PHP shell as the last you present it with a PHP shell and you can interact with the system. So going back to the beginning, um, you don't have access, you really need some password list and that's all you've really got. There's a whole bunch of different tools that you can use. Um, Hydra is one of the most common, also really, really, really loud. You can do some sort of regulating on it so you're not just throwing the Kool-Aid man at the wall and just having them barge through over and over again. Um, and there are some other tools. 
social engineers like push past me. There was definitely a problem where Apple doesn't have that. I don't remember the exact incident, but that was a problem I had at one point. So, harvesting um, credentials, I touched on this earlier with modifying the password term, um, replacing binaries that are on the system to do malicious things like um, steal someone's password because they're trying to change it or to do something else, like they shut down all the firewall. Right? There's this awesome tool called the Backdoor Factory, is it takes a binary. If you know anything about an executable, basically there's a whole bunch of bits that are lined up, ones and zeros that say, hey, processor, do these actions, right? Occasionally, inside of the binary, there's going to be a bit of free space, right? There's going to be like padding space so that your program can run efficiently and be like six byte aligned or whatever alignment you're using for the system. What Backdoor Factory can actually do is actually put your code that you want to in between those spaces. So you can say, Hey, do this and kind of hide it within the binary to keep it relatively the same size. You can also, um, instead of just trying to like shove it in there, recompile the binary. So a lot of like commands like cd, ls, are part of the GNU core utils or core utilities. All open source programs, you can go on GitHub or wherever they're hosting their um, source files, find it and look at the C code, right? And then what you can do is you can just make system calls in there and say, okay, do this stuff along with the rest of it. Pretty sneaky way to do some fun stuff. So, talk about some of some aliases. I think Brad gave you guys a fun time with aliases last week. Do I remember correctly? Yeah. Also, how much? Yeah. Okay. Just for fun up here, so I don't know. Um, so, you can set an alias for a command to do something else than what it's supposed to do, right? So, right here, you can alias the ls command, which you probably use a lot when you're using a Linux system. Um, Set to listen. That command is incorrect. Um, okay. Oh, no, it's not. Okay. The random variable. Gotcha. So that command we have right here is telling that cat to listen on this, which is an environment variable that you can set to be a random number, right? And then you're going to listen on that port, and when it connects to it, you're going to execute slash bin slash sh and then throw all of the errors to um, dev null and just don't print anything to the user, right? So then after we do that, you're going to print actually what ls is going to do, right? So you're creating a listener every time someone uses an ls. Also, the one down here is flushing the IP table calls, so saying all my firewall rules, I want them to go away every time I say ls. Yeah, what's up, Liam? This is the fault. Uh, at least on my Mac it is. I just did random and it's like it returned me a random number. Okay. This is it bounded between one and six five five three five. I just ran it a few times, so I don't know what it's bounded by. Okay. So you're probably gonna want to like actually set up a script or something that like ensures that. Um, I didn't write this slide. Um, um it's all below ten thousand, so nothing higher than Okay. It's probably in the range, but the whole idea of this is you want to be sure what your system is doing. So maybe trusting a random number is the best, but like write a random number script that does it instead of trusting something. Or just read the man page, right? And figure out what random actually does. Um, cool. Okay, so places for aliases. So um, Etsy profile is kind of like the top level uh, profile setup for your shell configuration, right? So in that directory, it'll have a whole bunch of information on like how your shell is supposed to be set up. And that continues down into the .bashrc file in your home directory and your .bash profile. You can put a whole bunch of configuration options in there and those files all end up calling each other. So the best way to do our privileges is talk to root, right? For system war and now for a competition setting, we can have fun. We can mess with root team because we know that if we get kicked out, we can get back in and we can do things like, you know, make every single do with one of the SL, the steam locomotive, or, you know, that. <laughs> <laughs> or just echo messages to them uh, via the wall command. So you can pretty much do anything now if you have root, you can have all the permissions in the system. Um, 
have you is we three different jobs. You use shell hooks and aliases. Shell hooks are like a super awesome version of an alias. Um, install new kits and malware factory components. There's this awesome program called SHC. SHC which will actually compile all these shell scripts. So if you're writing a bash program, um, it's all plain text, right? And if you run the file command on it, it'll say, oh, this is a bash script. I know it is because well, it's all written in plain text and it looks like bash, right? What SHC will do is it'll actually take that and compile it into a binary. So if you wanted to do the password command, because the password command is a binary, it's not a shell script. So if you run the file command on the password, it'll say, hmm, this is a binary. And if you modify this as it's a shell script, it'll show it's a shell script, which it shouldn't, and that looks kind of weird. But if you write your shell script to do something before it does what you're actually trying to do with the password command, and then you compile it, well, compile it so that it's a binary, so it can kind of be used to trick people. This is a really dirty trick, and if you want to mess with people, do that. It's really awesome. So from here, we're going to go into Brad's Red Team Group. So uh, I was again in charge of making the box you guys write last week. Um, how many of you guys had had fun with that? Yeah. Okay. How many of you want to punch me in the face? Oh yes, I do. That's a lot more hands. So yeah, I had a lot of fun putting a lot of crap on that box. Um, I didn't really put any like fine shells, as you can see. Like I had one on 1337 because I could. That was just a netcat buying shell where it just shoveled it all into slash bin slash bash, and it may have been running. No, no big deal. Just, it's just remote system administration. Uh, 22, yeah, Etsy password was the banner, so you, you could see if they changed the usernames and stuff and then log into them. I also allowed root logins, I allowed a new passwords. I allowed a lot of really not good things on that one. Uh, also, with SSH, I probably have this on another slide. Every single user had a backdoor private key that I gave to Red Team. So they could log in no matter what password you changed it to. And that key was shared across every single user's directory so they could log in to whoever they wanted with that key. Uh, I hope some of you fixed that because they just kept getting changed. Then uh, 21, FTP. Uh, there was a configuration line that said, do not set this to root, so I set it to root. <laughs> uh, and then I made it. I basically told it it has full right access to slash, and they could edit any configuration files, they could add shell scripts, they could download any single file they wanted. It was a good time. And that is how you can, that was a lot of the initial entry. So this is how they got in. Default credentials. That is how you get in every single time. That is the most common way you get in. You just hide your no password list. It is the quickest, easiest way to get in because it is legitimate. You can't block a legitimate login unless you have some really crazy access controls going on, but you're not going to have that set up in the first three minutes of the competition. Next up, the SSH keys. Those are a huge deal. If you see SSH keys and you don't need the SSH keys, you should delete them because then they have backdoor access regardless of what you set the password to be. FTPD, rank is root. If you see something with root access to slash, that's, that, that's just not good at all, ever. The configuration files uh, told you that, uh, so you could have seen that. You could have changed it, you could have restarted it, you could have set uh, no anonymous login to slash, no write access, disable the root chmod, and you would have been fine. You could have just restarted the service, and that would have been perfectly secure. That's all this is. There was a user, uh, not a backdoor, which totally was a backdoor. Uh, so what, one thing that was fun with that one is I edited Etsy password. So then this user had an UID set to zero. This is the thing a lot of people really check for. What this means is while it's not a backdoor, it is just a regular user, the UID zero says it gets the permissions of root. So if I log in as this user, I am, I am not effectively root, I am root. So you have to check to make sure that the permissions are not set to zero or some other setting that would allow them to have more access than they should. And then the uh, that catch shell on port 1337 will just run in the uh, bash RC. Maintaining access. Red team did a lot of stuff to maintain access. Well, one thing that I did was I CH modded 
That's the shadow to be 777, so literally any user on the system can modify and edit and read the password hashes so they can just add a new user and say this is their password hash and now they have another way to get back in the system. This was, this, this was my favorite one. I alias every single command you guys were running to drop your firewalls. If you had firewalls, if you set firewall, the command to set the firewall would drop the firewalls. That was great. It also broke a lot of things. I fixed it and made it better, so now it's even more evil. Go me. Uh, Red Team, what they did, they dropped a PAM module backwards. So PAM is basically how Linux authenticates users to the system. It stands for Pluggable Authentication Module. It, it, it controls how you can log in, like so when you type your password in, it handles that. They backdoored that so that they could see your passwords. Because normally they're encrypted, but if you have access to where the password goes, you can do whatever you want with it. Write it to a file, send it over a socket, change it, do anything really. Backdoor user accounts and empty passwords. It's the same thing as the not a backdoor user. However, there's another thing you can do, which is changing the user's shell. So if you take a look at the last field in Etsy password, it's the user shell. Normally it's going to be something like testing no login or something. That means that they can't log in. However, if they change it to slash bin slash bash, that means you can log in as a user and get a bash shell under their permissions and start interacting with the system in very fun ways and good ways. Bad passwords, you can just, like I said, default cred, they just set really crappy passwords, they just set blank passwords, they delete passwords. There's no amount of, there's no end to what you can do with passwords and status for them. And then just more that catch up. They were dropping those like just tic tac all over the place. Like rain. They made it rain. They, they pulled it over and gave all of you shells. <laughs> so this is a great manual. It is the Red Team Field Manual, RTFM, if you're familiar with that acronym. Please get this book. It contains a lot of one-liners, very quick reference information to common commands and utilities and system files. It, it, it's very great as a, like a 10,000 foot overview of how to Red Team. Uh, Only eight bucks. Yes, please get it. It is a fantastic resource. I've read this thing cover to cover like three times. So, disclaimer about that. It's a field name. It doesn't have words. It really just has commands. Right? Yeah. So it'll give you like a set of commands to start an SSH server, or start an FTP server using the Python, mm -hmm. or yeah. ways to use Netcat, or just like crazy little tools you need to do look up the index of where it is, you're like, I need to do this, okay, here are the commands that are really basic, this, the field name. It is, it, yeah. yeah, like you said, it's great for that, it basically has a set of recipes, like if you need to do this, here's how you do this, if you need to do B, here's how you, here's the command to do it, it's great for that. A lot, a lot of useful tools in there. Black Hat Python, I have not heard Ben say a single bad thing about this book, he loves it. I love Python. Is it automated SSM, SSM 
to fix a problem with your web server, you want to deploy it to like an entire section of your production web server infrastructure. What you can do is write an Ansible playbook or a little thing to do and say, okay, I want you to log into this group of hosts and I want you to run this script that will fix the problem. That's awesome from a systems administrator's administration standpoint. It's also awesome from a registry standpoint. So if my stuff actually worked last week and my computer's network thing didn't explode, um, what would have happened to all of your systems is simultaneously I would have logged into <coughs> all of you with a key that Brad could drop. And then I would have created probably about 20 users on your system, added um, a single SSH key for all of them, started a few services, started a few network, uh, network listeners, um, a whole bunch of line shows and stuff, all in the span of probably about 30 seconds, you all would have had that. It's really good for automating an attack on um, a large amount of folks that you know are configured and open in the same way. What's up, Lynn? I was going to say, it's also important to remember that you don't need to install Ansible on the client. Yes, it's, yeah. it's all SSH based. So your machine that you're launching from is the only thing you need Ansible. Um, everything else is just done via SSH or Telnet or R login or whatever um, access method you configure. All right, so we have two other folks here. The hackers play books pretty cool. He kind of walks you through the different tools that you might use and how to interact and attack the system. Definitely worth the read. How Linux work? If you want to break Linux, you gotta understand how it works. So read that book. It'll give you one of the most in-depth knowledges of Linux you'll ever read. So definitely worth uh, your time. Um, so TLDR this presentation. Well, the past couple of weeks we've been telling you how to do stuff, but this week we kind of didn't exactly tell you how to do red teaming. That's because you guys should have seen through this presentation. Everyone does red teaming differently. Everyone will attack the system differently. And there's different services running on every box. You can't attack the box the same way every time. So you have to kind of figure out what's on that. That's why we went over gathering information so much because that's really critical to attacking the system and everyone has a different method. So you've all seen the VM from last week. We're using the same, the same VM this week so you can make people cry. Brad even made it more mean for himself. I'm not sure why. I think he dropped himself yeah. on the stage one of the week. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's even worse. I figured I don't get another chance to make people cry. So I had some really fun games. You guys are going to lie.
possible buffer overflow or leak for not being properly checked. But one of the biggest things to look for when you're using a particular system, um, and, and you can provide an input, um, send in all sorts of garbage input. I'm like a manual fudger. I just send all sorts of bullshit and random things I find and just watch things fall over. Um, and if you see things that are not behaving in the expected way, then there's probably something going on that's worth further investigation. And so I'm not I'm not a savant when it comes to crafting, you know, rock chains or anything super fancy to get privilege escalation. But really, you're looking for things that don't really behave in the expected way. So that could be anything from a system library, or even perhaps a kernel module. All the kernel modules in a Linux system are running as a root user because they really can't work any other way. Or they might be working on something in the future, but anybody who knows Linux Torvalds knows. So there's a various, uh, it's, it's going to be a long and slow process and, and being able to attack the kernel um, is certainly possible. And you can certainly attack the kernel from user space as well by using utilities that interface with things at the kernel level. Um, so you can be like programs like FDisk or whatever that you use to mess around with your hard drive. Well, you can't mess around with your hard drive unless it jumps into the kernel module that actually has the driver to do hard things. And so again, looking for weird, uh, when you send input to things and it's not behaving correctly, um, you can certainly break stuff with that. I would literally, this morning, I was trying to do something with FDisk and I hit Control D when I should have hit Control C and it went into an infinite loop. This is a bug in upstream software. I had no I had no expectation that that sort of thing was happening, but now I have to file a bug report with the people that write FDisk because I did something that was completely random to see and D aren't that far away from each other on the keyboard. And then you could potentially fork somebody's hard drive 